behalf of the Odeonic team in Whitex, uh, I would like to welcome you all to your WNAS event here uh, at headquarters. It was uh, not difficult to say yes to the challenge when Sophie and Søren asked me to be part of this event. If there's something I really love to talk about, it's about what we do to make every hearing uh, available to the users of Whitex products. Just a few uh, words about myself. I have been in this business since 1986. Some of you in the room may not even be born then. So I, I, sometimes I feel like one of the dinosaurs uh, in the industry. Uh, but uh, when I started out in this work, uh, I was a student at the University of Copenhagen. I was studying audio logopedy, uh, which is speech and hearing sciences. And uh, my first hearing aid fittings in practice was with wide hearing aids. And there was one product at the time that I was very happy to fit, it was a Widex A8. And those of you who have gray hair know that a Widex A8 was a fantastic hearing aid to fit because people who had it wanted it again and again and again. Why? Because it had a fantastic sound. And it came with a little screwdriver, and when I had that screwdriver in my hand, I felt like I was the most empowered audiologist in the whole world. Fantastic hearing aid, fantastic screwdriver, and then I did my <laughs> And uh, then a lot of things happened, and you all know what happened. Now we're sitting with computers, we're sitting with advanced technologies, sitting with Bluetooth technologies, and a lot of added effects. But it still boils down to making a change in people's lives and bringing them back into their life that they have lost contact to. It's all about giving them their hearing back. And that problem is still the same. That challenge is still the same. But the way we go about solving it and the way we go about understanding that problem has changed quite a bit since I was treading my children's shoes in the domain of audiology. So let's start. My talk today will be about real-life hearing effortlessly and then a perspective on outcome measures. Because as we develop hearing aids here at Widex, we also have to look at the way that we test how our products actually work. And some of our outcome measures come from a time of classical old time audiology. And we are seeing a movement in outcome measures into something that is more relatable to real life and something that's more relatable into objective measures. And how can we understand these types of outcome measures better and use them to develop better solutions for your customers and also for you, of course. But first, let me just uh, tell you that over many, many years of experience with hearing impaired people and with hearing aids, it's clear to me and to a lot of my colleagues here at Widex that to make a difference for people who want to hear more and hear better, we know that our understanding and our insights must go beyond hearing loss and hearing loss compensation. And I'm sure all of you agree with me on this. All of us who have sat with people know that it's not just the amount of DBs that we compensate for hearing loss with. It's about understanding the person with the hearing loss, the life that's led with the hearing loss, and it's making the right counseling the right narrative for that person in order for them to take a step into back into the hearing world. It's really us taking a step away from all the classical insights we have had in our training, in our work. We know a lot about hearing loss. We know a lot about hearing loss compensation. We also know a lot about auditory processing. We know that binaural hearing aids are much better than monaural hearing aids. That was established in the 70s. You need to wear hearing aids on both sides of your head. Why? Because otherwise, the auditory system and the cognitive function will deteriorate on the side that's not uh, helped with the hearing aid. We know a lot about precision and fitting. We do a lot of insertion gain measurements. We say, yeah, the hearing aid compensates completely as it should for your hearing loss. And we know a lot about rehabilitation. So we've spent the first 50 or 60 years of our lives diving into the speciality of auditory processing, edging our way into auditory cognition, and understanding a little bit about the situation in people's lives. 
to truly make a difference moving forward here at Rhinex, what we believe we need to do is to understand a lot more about context, a lot more about circumstance, a lot more about intent and emotions for the individual person in order to truly make a difference in their lives. And we can begin to see that solutions in the future will be fueled more about it with information about context and circumstance, intent and emotions, and maybe personalize the solutions even more to the user for that particular person that goes beyond the sound domain. So what we really need to do is to move our focus more over into valuation and behavior. And that is what we do in our human interaction with people. We begin to understand how they react, what is important, what makes an impact, we start to develop personalized solutions through an understanding of the personalized preferences. We begin to understand that the intent in a situation is probably more important to the solution than just the hearing loss. Maybe I want to understand what's being said, maybe I just want to all monitor, maybe I just want to relax. All of those parameters will play into how the hearing aid will work in the future, more than hearing loss compensation alone. So we will be able to provide differentiated sound experiences that are based on emotions and intent, on top of course, that we are compensating for hearing loss. So our jobs as audiologists come from the medical profession, come from the deeply rooted medical audiology. But we are going to move our work into understanding more about what persons want and what their intentions are, because technologies will allow us to feed that information into the hearing aids and make the solutions even more personalized. So, to create effortless hearing in the future, we have to start making a difference where the hearing aid user and the device meet each other, right where evaluation and behavior begins. This takes the work away from the clinical situation and into real life. It takes adaptation of the device and the solution into the life people needs more than the clinical situation if we cannot, in the clinical situation, establish something that mimics real life. How many of you have had customers come back to you and try telling you about a situation where they did not hear as they have wanted to? How many? How easy was it for the person to explain exactly what was at stake and what they needed? Was it easy? Why was it difficult? Was it because it wasn't completely clear to you what the situation was? Was it because you didn't really understand what the person wanted out of that situation? Was it because you were trying to fit a gain in the hearing aid from a certain input level, but indeed the situation was not at that input level. Clients will explain to you they were in a really noisy environment. And then if you go back and measure that environment, it was really quiet. But for them, they sensed that it was noisy. Their, ex ex their impression was there was a lot of noise. The opposite could be the case. They said, no, no noise. But it could be an extremely noisy environment. So your job gets really difficult because you have no access to those situations. But we need that access to make a good difference for these people. So at MyLex, we see our core audiological ambition to make the perfection of hearing as easy as possible for everybody. We would like to enable our users to connect with their lives and hear effortlessly, and we believe that we can do that through use of intelligence in our hearing aids, through use of our intelligence in our software in the future, through the use of highly personalized solutions that go beyond the personalization for hearing loss, and also through the use of seamless signal processing, meaning automation and interaction go hand in hand. That's the vision and the future we see for our solutions at Wilex. So let's talk a little bit about real life hearing effortlessly. Why is this important, and and what are the re what are the reasonings behind them? 
all of our customers, all of our users live lives that are made up of situations where different auditory stimuli uh, impact their lives. Some lead quiet lives, and some lead noisy lives. Some go dancing, some go to the library, some stay at home, and some have a lot of family dinners. In each and every part of their lives, they expect to be able to hear efficacy. But the hearing aids need to adapt seamlessly to every situation. So it really is about understanding the full scope of the situation around the user. What situations are most important? What's the auditory processing situation? What's the level of cognition available? And what, how do they react to the solutions we actually provide them with? And to get a 360 degree understanding of that. In order to approach effortless hearing, it's tempting to go and uh, look at effort. What level of mental energy are we actually using when we're trying to understand what's going on around us? Hearing, listening, understanding, it's all tied together. It's not necessarily a fact that you can understand if you can hear, but it's certainly a fact that you need to be able to hear something in order to be able to listen, and then you need to be able to listen in order to understand what's going on around you. <clears throat> and in order to actually understand what's going on around you, you need to be able to identify that there is something you need to understand. You need to be able to explore the ideas, what's going on around me. You need to select, oh, well, this is probably the thing that's going on around me right now. You need to confirm that that's actually the case, and then evaluate whether or not you did the right uh, decision in your, in your thought process. All of this happens really, really fast, and in order to be able to do this, a premises you need to be able to hear. No doubt about that. At Wineage, we have built a rationale around our sound that was strongly tied to the wish to provide audibility at all input levels. We believed since the evolution of digital hearing aids that audibility is the first premise we need to secure. And all of you who've been here before and who've been taught by Wideix trainers will know that we have a strong belief that both soft sounds, normal level sounds, and loud sounds should be audible. They should be soft and loud and normal level, but they should be distinguishable between them. So we aim at providing natural loudness perception with our hearing aids. Uh, this is an input output graphic for uh, one frequency in our hearing aids where we give more gain for softer levels than we give for loud levels because of the non-linear non characteristic of the auditory system. When we look at aging and the brain, this has been a topic, hot topic in our industry for quite some time. Understanding the effect of aging on people. Naturally, aging affects people's ability to understand what's going on around them and to multitask. And one of the things that I think most audiologists are quite aware of in the field is that as you grow older, things may take a little longer time to do and to grasp. But it's not difficult to grasp if you're not pressed for time. Um, when you get older, as you can see on the graphics over here, your long-term memory will drop, your working memory will drop, but your vocabulary will, will be increased. Which means that as you grow older, you learn more, you understand more. But if you are pressed for effort, pressed for time, have to multitask, then it might actually be difficult to understand what's going on around you. So, if you are an aging person, and most of our customers are aging persons, uh, it is really important for them to be able to hear what's going on around them in order to get something out of the situation. If you look at the brain uh, and aging in regards to hearing, we know there's a lot of hair cell loss, there's a lot of synapses, and there is a, uh, a, a degradation of coding of the auditory system uh, as you grow older. What does this mean? It means that it becomes more difficult to attend to different sound sources around you. It becomes more necessary for you to have a clear sound coming into your ears so that you can hear what other sources you want to listen to. 
That's why we believe sound quality and the precision in sound processing is important for hearing aids for the elderly population. Two uh, theories or two methods uh, are very much discussed right now in our research labs, both for how we determine what's going on around the user in the real life, auditory scene analysis, uh, and uh, <coughs> auditory is one of them. The auditory scene analysis is really uh, the uh, method by which we extract information in a situation where we can determine where we are, what's happening, where the sound source is placed. And based on all this information, we determine what is this type of situation, where am I at? This is significant input into understanding what is actually going on around us. And it's a rather high complex uh, uh, cognitive uh, function where you're using information from both sides of the ears, of the head. When you combine the uh, auditory scene analysis with the ease of language understanding model, you actually get two models that you can work with trying to understand the importance of signal processing and hearing aids and the combination of good uh, hearing aids on both sides of the head. Ease of language understanding is trying to explain what happens when people are stressed to understand what's going on. In a non-stressful situation where there's no background noise, you and I are talking in my living room, it's not, not difficult to hear what I'm saying. Every word I say makes sense to you. Everything I say just glides through and is easily understood in your, le in your lexical uh, part of your brain and you make an easy match with the words I'm saying. Everything makes sense. If then I switch to French and you don't speak French, your brain will start searching for matches to the words I'm saying and trying to understand what I'm saying, but you are looking in your Danish or your Norwegian, your vocabulary, and it makes absolutely no sense. In that situation, you will start using your explicit uh, uh, processing in your brain to try and see if you can make matches, try to dive into your memory, see if you can find something that makes my words come out as sensible. That's when you start using your working memory. You try to find solutions to the problem in your brain while you're listening to it. If you have reduced working memory, such a situation is really stressful and your intelligibility will drop, you will not be able to fully understand what I'm, what I'm saying to you. The same will happen if you're wearing a hearing aid that distorts really badly. If the hearing aid distorts the sound coming in to your head, you will not be able to match completely the words that I'm saying with what's stored in your memory, in your brain. That's why the sound of the hearing aid is so important. So in the ease of language understanding model, we are looking at a model that, that looks at matching what's in our memory with what's coming in through the hearing aids. And if it goes easy, it goes through as implicit processing. If it goes, if there's an obstruction, there is no match, you need to start using your working memory. Combine the two models, we have a situation where speech phonological information is going into your brain through your ears. You have your auditory scene analysis that helps you understand the situation, what's going on around you. And if it's an easy situation where there is no disturbance, you glide directly through to understanding what's going on around you through your implicit processing. But the minute you have a hearing loss, the minute you are hearing that that distorts the sound that's being processed, the minute that there is a background noise, you need to dial in and use your working memory in order to understand what's being said to you. And that's what takes time, that's what makes you tired, that's what makes you retreat from noisy situations, because you cannot understand what's being said to you, and the load, the cognitive load is too high for you. In essence, all hearing aids manufacturers will try to make hearing aids that will make it easy for the user to make this match at a higher cognitive level. When we don't distort the signal, where we don't change essential parts of the signal, so it's easy to make the match at a higher cognitive level. But hearing and listening and understanding is truly hard work. This is a spectrogram of speech and background noise. All you can see here is that there is probably some high frequency frequencies here above the noise floor, but you cannot make out the distinct pattern of the speech. What is being said here is actually still not legible. 
But if we take away the background noise, which is essentially what makes it difficult, all of a sudden the clear pattern of what is being said comes out, stands out from the background, and you can actually understand what's being said. This is what hearing aids do. They take away the background noise and filter through the speech so it becomes clear and more easy to understand. At Widex, we believe in capturing all the sounds, purifying the input, and processing so that everything sounds as natural as possible. And our technology will take into account that no artifacts are added into the signal pathway in the hearing aids. We will take care to look at the situation. Is there wind noise? Nothing is added into the, the signal passing into the hearing aid. All background noise is filtered out. We are looking at where is the sound coming from? What is the focus we want to give to the user? Can we direct the microphones in a special direction so that we can get a better signal to noise ratio for our user? Can we allow some degree of interaction with the device that is not disturbing but clever enough that, so that the user can actually hear better if he needs improvement on the fly? And can we make sure that our devices are actually as automatic as possible so that they become the first thing you put on in the morning and the last thing you take off at night? And in between, the ambition is you haven't thought about it at all. I think that would be the best hearing aid in the world. The one you put on in the morning and the one you take off at night. And in between, you've been able to do exactly what it was you wanted to do. That's the ambition for all of our engineers in our IT department every day. They want to provide interaction, they want to provide intelligent signal processing, and at the end of the road, it's always a guiding star to have a device that's as automatic as possible. So that we, as hearing aid users, when I get there, I will get there at some point, I can just be the person I want to be and forget about the device on my ear. Let me turn the uh, topic a little bit toward outcome measures. How many of you use outcome measures in your clinic when you test the, when you, when you sell hearing aids or provide hearing aids? Yeah? Do some of you use the really measurements? Yeah? And questionnaires? Some kind of questionnaires as well? The true value of a hearing aid, is that measured in the clinic truly for the user? Yeah? I would say that if the user, if the log and the hearing aid show me that the user wore the hearing aid every day from morning till night, and my really a measurement didn't show that the hearing aid actually matched the target, the fitting target that I had, then I would be actually quite happy. The user wore the hearing aids, I was happy, I could hear, but my fitting room didn't really match the target. That was actually how I worked when I worked in Gain Software. I can share that with you. I had a, a doctor, a professor, who had a fitting room that was very, very uh, high frequency focused. And he wanted us to make frequency uh, really measurements and show that we matched the targets every time we made a fitting. What I did was I fitted the hearing aids and then I measured the, the real measurement and then I put in the exit on top of the line because then my customers or my patients were happy. They had the sound that they could live with and, and tolerate and they actually wore the hearing aids. And my superior was happy because I actually did the real measurement and made the tact. He just didn't know that I did it the opposite in the reverse, in the reverse order. <laughs> that I guess is a patient focus, right? You listen to what the customers want, you listen to what your patients want, you try and push them in the right direction but you don't force them to walk around with something that they don't like to listen to. Um, in the future, we will probably be seeing other ways of looking at outcome measures than we are today. Um, we need outcome measures because we need to understand what is the effect of what we do, both on listening effort that I talked about before, but also on real life behavior. Does this actually make a difference in those difference in those real life situations where users are actually using our devices. Um, today we expect that a hearing aid does more than just making sounds audible at one meter distance. When I started out in the industry it was really a hearing aid 
and it was all about making speech audible in quiet situations. Today, most of you and most of your customers are expecting our hearing aids to solve listening situations that are relatively complex. Noisy environments where they expect to be able to hear probably better than normal hearing people because we expect technology to do fantastic things for us every day. So we talk about what is difficult in our hearing life with our customers. We talk about what real life hearing is for them. In which situations do they see the most challenges? Those situations should be the balance point for our outcome measures, more than a really, really a measurement uh, in itself. I know for a lot of markets, really a measurements are important for reclaiming subsidies from insurance companies and health organizations, so I fully accept that they are just one part of the picture and we need a fuller part, fuller picture to understand everything that's going on around the hearing aid user and our devices. Just to um, show you, this is a graph showing uh, the benefit or the uh, limitations of traditional speech testing at sig uh, fixed signal to noise ratios. If you uh, measure speech intelligibility testing with Dantana Lista or with other speech uh, audiometry lists, it is well known that there are uh, quite uh, some uh, limitations in using these because depending on the signal to noise ratio you're using for testing, you risk running into ceiling effects or flow effects, meaning that at some point you really can't show an improvement or change, and it's not possible to show a difference between different solutions in a given situation because there is this ceiling effect. How many of you use speech audiometry for outcome measures? Yeah. Uh, another way to go about speech audiometry is actually to start testing the 50% correct uh, balance point in your speech audiometry and find a signal to noise ratio where the user can actually understand about 50% of what's being said. That's actually a statistically a more relevant measure because you don't get the ceiling effect. And then you can see with this device, they can find the 50% intelligibility point at this signal to noise ratio, and with another device, they can go worse or better depending on the device and how it works. These are two very common outcome measures used both in research but also in clinics. <coughs> what our challenge really is is that speech audiometry or speech recognition doesn't really tell us anything about listening effort or listening intent. It doesn't show anything about that. It shows us about an instantaneous response to speech stimulus in a given noise environment at that particular time. What we would like to move towards as an industry is something that is more ecologically valid for real life for, you, for people with hearing loss. This means that we need to move into a situation where we are testing people in situations that are, are representative of the situations that they live in. This means that we need to take our evaluations maybe from the lab into real life rather than have it being fixated into a sound booth and a set of headphones or loudspeakers. Uh, I will walk you through uh, two uh, approaches to outcome measures, the EEG uh, outcome measure and uh, EMA, uh, Ecological Momentary Assessment Method, because these are two methods that we are investigating here at WIAX to see how we can actually work with them to prove the uh, efficiency of our products, but also to use them in the development of new algorithms for the future. Because in order to make new algorithms and new solutions for the future, we believe we need to go into real life and see what's happening out there more than being in the lab. Because life is much different than lab. That's where we get access to intent and context and circumstance and also emotions of those that we want to work with. Let's uh, first of all focus on listening effort <coughs> and, um, and how we can use those for, uh, as outcome measures. We talked about uh, listening effort earlier uh, and it's very simple. 
our devices should not increase listening effort, they should give uh, access to less of listening effort in any situation. It should not be so that our users of Widex products feel more stressed and more cognitive challenged with our devices than without them. We would want our users to feel that they can relax and be part of a situation and not worry about hearing and understanding what's going on around them. And how to demonstrate that. It's, it's funny because uh, when I started in this business, we were all about the ear, we were all about city we were all about hair cells, we were all about hearing loss. And today, we're talking, yeah, we know what's going on here, but we're also talking a lot about the brain. We're talking a lot about what is it, in fact, that makes people understand what's going on around them. What, and how do we measure what's going on around up here? Because the solution is not just found down here. We do not give speech intelligibility back to people by simply giving them gain and matching a fitting target. Sometimes we do funny things for our hearing aids that improve speech intelligibility where we think, huh, that's funny. Why would that work? And that's because the personalized solution is much better than the average solution. So it would be interesting to see if there is a way to get access to what is happening up in the brain and uh, make that accessible to evaluate the efficiency of our solutions. Uh, the development of cognitive science uh, is actually quite interesting. As early as Aristotle, there is findings in the literature about the brain, and Aristotle actually thought that the brain was the body's cooling system, which is quite interesting. Uh, and then uh, uh, it was uh, around 150 years after Christ that the brain was first believed to be the source of mental activity. Uh, but it wasn't until very uh, late in the 19th century where uh, cognitive science actually began to be something that evolved. People began to interest themselves in what is happening in this brain. What is the brain? What does the brain do? And uh, the first uh, research went into understanding the blood flow of, of the brain. Uh, and then Bocar uh, and Merke uh, established the two centers in the brain that actually uh, control the perception and the production of speech. And uh, they found out about this due to war injuries in some of the wars in, the, in Europe. They saw that some of the soldiers lost their capacity to speak or they lost the capacity to understand what was being said to them. And they localized areas in the brain through the brain injuries that these soldiers had suffered during the wars in the Europe uh, in, the, in the 19th century. But it isn't until the 1989 that the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience was first published. And that shows us that it's a very new area of research that is fully established. There's a lot of research going to understand what's actually happening out there in our brain. And if you watch TV shows now, uh, in Denmark there's a lot of shows going on around what the brain can do and what the brain cannot do and what we can do to interact with the brain is becoming really the hot topic around uh, the industry but also in our uh, society uh, today. But if we want to measure listening effort, there are a lot of different er uh, measure measurements that we can use. This is actually an old picture from uh, the 19th century where they started mapping up different areas of the brain and what they it related to through uh, uh, interaction uh, with the brain injury people and other people who suffer from different diseases, then they were met in different areas of the brain, like this. But going back to listening effort, how do we measure it? There's a lot of physiological measures that we can use. EEG, head scans, MRIs, a lot of different ways that we can measure what's going on in the brain right now. There is cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, looking at what what is what is what are people doing, or how they're behaving, and mapping that against stimuli, tolerance of noise, and then of course subjective ratings. How difficult is the situation? How do you find this situation compared to a similar situation? Is it more difficult, more easy? Many different areas that we can go into and work with if we want to map listening effort. One of the areas
areas that we are investigating in uh, rather heavily and widely is the opportunities within EEG. Why would we go in this direction, do you think? If you think about it, the ear canal is very close to the brain, right? So we could actually put electrodes inside the ear canal and get direct access to the brain and the EEG measures. And wouldn't it be fantastic if one day we could patch that up with a hearing aid and then all of a sudden we are directly connected to intent and emotion and stress. And then the hearing aid could actually somehow be more intelligent than it is today. So EEG is really one of the first and raw measures of activity in the brain that has been used over the past few decades. It is a relatively easy accessible uh, measurement where you put electrodes around the scalp today uh, of, the, of the patient you want to measure. And uh, what you really get from a DEG is a response in different bands where you can interpret the activity level of the brain uh, through the spikes in the response. And an EEG measurement is, in fact, really, um, you could, you could um, explain it like this. You're standing outside a football stadium. If everybody in that stadium is a supporter of FC Copenhagen, at some point they will start singing and ch chanting the chants of FC Copenhagen. The people outside will be able to hear what they're singing, and they're singing FC Copenhagen if all of them sing the same thing at the same time. Not because they can hear every distinct word the audience in the football stadium is singing, but because everybody is singing in the same rhythm and at the same pace. That's what EEG is. It's the neurons in the brain firing at the same rhythm and at the same speed, and that's why we can pick up these responses from the brain, because if all the neurons are firing at the same time in the same pace, we can pick up these waveforms and understand what's going on. If they are firing all over the place without a pattern, then we cannot read anything out of them. That's how we can stimulate the brain with a certain stimulus, get the brain firing in one direction, and then read off of that stimulus what's going on in the brain. Very much like what's happening in a football stadium when the FC Copenhagen scores, everybody sings, and then those outside will know that FC Copenhagen scored. It's very much the same thing with EEG. So, if we can start using the measures of EEG as an indicator of stress, as an indicator of, yes, I'm fine, I'm doing fine, then the hearing aid at some point will know that it's actually doing the right thing or that it should adjust to another direction. And it can also be a response we can simply use as an outcome measure for the effect of our signal processing. One of the uh, spikes is the alpha spike, which is really as, as one of the spikes that has been investigated quite a bit into demonstrating the hearing aid efficiency. Um, <coughs> this, oh, sorry. This is a, a graphic from Oblaser et al. from 2012, where they've actually tried to read the power of the alpha wave uh, to reflect the engagement of the neural network to uh, related to cognitive demand. And here you can see that the higher the memory load and the higher the acoustic degradation of the signal, the higher the alpha wave is. Meaning that if you stimulate with core signals that require a higher degree of processing of the brain, you can read it off in the alpha wave in the EEG measurement. A similar study of uh, the effect of different signal processing, uh, directional microphones and noise reduction systems has shown that the alpha power also <coughs> increases when you are processing without directional microphones compared to signals where you have directional microphones involved in the signal processing of hearing aid. Meaning that it is actually possible to use EEG outcome measures as a somewhat objective measure of effect of the processing inside a hearing aid. The really exciting thing is that 
Right now, we are in a research uh, project with uh, one of our colleagues in the industry, Oticon, trying to find out how sensors in hearing aids might actually become something of the future. So the intelligent hearing aid will be very different tomorrow than it is today. We will be able to build sensors, EEG sensors, into the surface of ear molds and shells and tap information off the ear canal about the function of the brain and use that for different purposes. We can adjust hearing aid features real time, we can track the motion of eyes and maybe then track the motion of directional microphones in order to create focus person we're looking at rather than anyone else. So track your eyes and then select focus in the hearing aid. All in all, we can use EEG to characterize our hearing aid listeners, to set up the hearing aids in a more intelligent manner, to demonstrate efficiency of our algorithms, but also to build more intelligent devices for the future. And when this is said, the field of audiology will all of a sudden open up again and be something that is very closely tied to cognitive science rather than to otolaryngology. Because now we're getting one step closer into the cognitive space. And imagine the amount of new knowledge and insight and operational tools you will get that will open up a whole new field of interaction with your customers where it will, it will cement that we need specialists to work with our hearing aids. It will cement that this is a field of high-level audiology that moves with the technological evolution. So the perspectives in this is quite amazing. And it's on the doorstep right now of everything we do and how we think. So it's taking our thinking closer to the brain, but also closer to people's real life, because we will get to connect with them through these devices when they are using them out there where their hearing is at stake. The next chapter I would like to just focus on briefly is real life outcome measures. It's actually something completely different. And there's always two sides to a coin. And uh, we can do so much with technology and so much with sensors. But today we also need outcome measures that we can work with that will augment our current work that will allow us to look into the real lives of our users today. And this is what I would like to talk about right now. If uh, you have been to New York, you will know that this is a really, really noisy area. It's Times Square. And there are a lot of people walking to work, going home from work, sitting in cafes, driving cars, walking around. And each of them is surrounded by their own acoustic scene. For some it's very noisy, for some it's very quiet and they are sometimes in transition from one place to another. What is really interesting to know is what are signal to noise ratios of real life? What is it in fact that we can use as a measure of benefit in real life right now? When we test speech intelligibility in our lab, we need to test a signal to noise ratio that we are not completely sure we know actually they are not representative of real life. Because we need to make the situations more difficult than real life really is in order for our, our measurements to be not saturated, not to go to ceiling or to floor effect. Uh, our research started in 2008, quite some years ago, where we, uh, together with the University of Oldenburg, established what are the real life mystic situations characterized by? What signal to noise ratios is it that people are actually exposed to in their real lives? How uh, noisy are they? How difficult are they to listen to? And we had uh, 20 experienced and satisfied hearing aid users who were wearing recorders throughout their days, in recording different sound scenarios, for us to try and establish what is actually going around. And the main results are that the estimated signal-to-noise ratios are generally quite positive in real-life situations. They are not very, very negative, as you might think, when you hear people talk about their real-life situations. Um, real-life situations are also characterized by behavior. 
meeting in a noisy situation and I want to hear what your name is saying, I will walk up to her and I will stand close to her. I may even turn my back to the noise and hold my hand up so I can hear what she's saying. So I compensate for the noisy environment and therefore it is not that noisy as the, the measurement actually would say it is. So my subjective experience of the noisy environment is quite different from what the objective measurement says. We only measured uh, in a, in a, over a couple of days, uh, so therefore there might be some, uh, some methodology in this. But the most important result was that uh, the signal to noise ratios of these people's real life situations were relatively positive. Between 5 to 10 dB range, but reported with, uh, uh, with some kind of variation. The kitchen situation, as you can see up here, was rated quite difficult for, uh, and as a relatively stressful situation for these uh, users. And this was what brought us on to that, what my intent is actually plays a part into how much, how difficult I deal with these situations. In a kitchen situation, there are usually noisy um, appliances. You have a coffee brewer and a kettle and washing machine and all these noisy things going on. You're usually standing at a counter cutting up things and then all of a sudden your husband starts talking to you. So you're focusing on not cutting your fingers and cooking and making sure that the food will taste nice and then somebody starts distracting you with conversation. That's actually a highly complex listening environment when you're trying to do one thing and somebody wants to engage in dialogue with you. It's the most, the situation that was most, rated the most difficult situation of all because you would try to do something but be distracted by a, 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 a speech interaction. So to understand exactly what's going on in a listening environment is quite essential because I would have never thought that the kitchen situation is really, really stressful. But when you think about it and you listen to the research, of course it's stressful because you're standing with your back, usually cutting up things, water is running, pans, everything is cooking, and then somebody wants to talk about the news or what was happening today, grandchildren are maybe coming for dinner, and it's really difficult to hear what they're saying in that situation. So it is not just about the acoustical situation, it's about the context and the circumstance of the situation. That's what's important to understand. And I think from an audiology rehabilitation perspective, that's immensely important. Understand what's at stake. And what's at stake is not acoustics. What's at stake is relationships. It is about communication. It's about being competent in that particular situation. So uh, at OKEU, we have a research facility in Stockholm. They went on to investigate further what we call the common sound scenarios. It is actually a framework to start establishing what are the common sound scenarios that our users experience in real life. And they are uh, essentially um, grouped in three um, main groups. There are situations that are related to speech, understanding, there are relation, uh, situations related to focus listing, and then there are some non-specific situations where it's neither the one thing or the other that people have characterized. And if we look at the research from uh, OKU, it's actually quite interesting that 47% of people's lives are non-specific listening situations. Only about 30% of their situations in their lives are focused towards speech communication. Now, what does that mean for hearing aid fitting? It means that hearing devices should actually work not just for speech communication, but for non-specific situations as well. And what are the expectations for people in these situations? What is it that we do for people? What are their reactions? What are they reacting to? When I was working as a dispensing audiologist, I thought everything was about speech. I thought everything was about speech intelligibility. It's not always about speech intelligibility. It's about many different situations. So, an approach that we can use in order to establish this is a method called ecological commentary assessment. It is a method by which we can interact with the user 
while he's out there in his real life and prompt him for answers via an app and say, what is the situation you're in right now? How do you feel right now? What are you doing right now? How is the hearing aid actually working for you right now? And we actually done a study on this at OKU where we prompted our test subjects every other hour, which is quite a bit of disturbance in your life. But this was research and they had signed up for it, so that was okay. Uh, they did though say that every other one and a half hour is quite easy, so maybe we can take it down a notch, right? But uh, the research was every hour and a half. Um, and it actually gives us a way to be out there in real life rather than relying on memory. Memory is not a, a friend. Memory is a guy who paints a picture that looks nice. Uh, so therefore it's really good to be out there and prompt them in, in real life. This kind lady is sitting on a bench in a park. There are some children playing, but is she really relaxing? Is she trying to solve a problem or is she monitoring the children? Who are we to know? But her reaction to what we do will be depending not just on the children playing, but on her intent in that situation. And with ecological momentary assessment, we will be able to find out, I'm sitting on a bench, I'm thinking about work, there are children, noisy children in the background, I hate it, sounds bad. Okay, now we know the situation. Or I'm sitting on a bench, I'm watching my grandchildren, I love it, it sounds great. Two very different scenarios. But if she just said, I was sitting on a bench and the wind was noisy and I didn't really like it, we need to know more about that situation. It's about why and what she's doing. So, our ecological momentary assessment is a method by which we can embrace more than the sound domain. It's about embracing intent and context and circumstance. And uh, we did a small study where we asked uh, a group of test subjects to evaluate two hearing aid settings in a, in a test hearing aid. And this was really uh, both a test of an algorithm, but also a test of a method. We wanted to see what we could get out of this. And uh, they were prompted every one, hour and a half. And we actually got 1,044 responses from these 10 respondents. That's quite a few responses from only 10 subjects. All of a sudden now the magic of the power of numbers goes up, right? We have a lot of responses. The statistics look quite, quite good. It's not so much the algorithm that's interesting here. What's interesting is that there was a clear preference for preference A over preference B. A few could not hear a difference, uh, and some said there was a, that, that they heard a difference, but they had no preference. This in itself could be interesting for our researchers. What is really interesting if you map it against the, the common sound scenarios and say, okay, if we map this against our common sound scenarios, can we see a pattern? Is there something about the way people choose that's related to the scenario they are in, or the way that they like things done. So we map the different sound scenarios against the preferences up here. And as you can see, lo and behold, setting A was mostly preferred in the situations where speech was present, or focus listing was preference, and setting B was most preferred in situations where you were monitoring, or you were listening passively to your surroundings. All of a sudden, it makes sense. But it doesn't make sense to say that this is the right algorithm. It makes sense to say, in those situations where speech is present, this is the algorithm that makes sense. But please do not forget that other algorithm was preferred in other situations. What does this mean? It means that our hearing aids need to be able to adapt automatically to different listening environments. Otherwise, we're making a mistake. It's not just about speech, it's about the environment you're in and the intent you have in that situation. Now the interesting part here is that if you took the 10 test subjects and mapped their common sound scenario situations, because they were mapping what situation are they in, you can see that they each have a profile, right? Interesting. All of a sudden now, if we had a profile for what life, what auditory life do our people live, would you focus your counseling data 
Would you not use that as part of your counseling and selling products and promoting and, and, and recommending solutions? Fantastic. Now there are two subjects here, this guy and this guy. Look at those. Very similar profiles. Passive listening, focus to media. I bet you these two were relatively old, sitting at home, watching a lot of television, and listening to the radio. Those two guys, sorry, sorry, no, 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 were the ones that had a definite preference for the B setting. The B setting that was more tailored to a softer environmental monitoring sound and speech communication. They are not in life situations where speech is in focus. They are more towards environmental monitoring and listening to, to television. All of a sudden now we have a framework where we can understand more about our users and how we should evolve the way our hearing aids work. That's why it's so important to go beyond classical outcome measures, classical ways of understanding things and using new methods to test what we do and to understand what's going on in the lives of our users. And that's where our research is going at WIDEX. Orca EU is one of the leading research facilities in the industry in ecological momentary assessment. And Orca US, which is our research site in, the, in Chicago, is working on outcome measures through EEG measures. And we have our collaboration on our EEG with our Oticon right here on our third floor, evolving our technology for the future. So audiology will be much more than hearing loss and gain matrices and insertion gain measurements in the future. There's a whole new chapter that's being written for us, and it's both going into real life with this and into the lab with EEG measurements and opening up new doors of understanding for us. It really is about opening up the door to understanding more about context and circumstance, intent and emotions through a full understanding of the situation around the user. Hearing is a connection to life for our users. It is what makes or breaks a day for everyone we meet. When we start to lose our hearing, science or research tells us it will start to retract from interaction and if we don't do something about it, we will suffer cognitively because we will not be stimulated uh, in our minds as we should be continuously as long as we live. We pursue perfect hearing at WIDEX because we believe that no one should miss out on life. Our technology, our aim for our technology is to perfect hearing as best we can with as advanced technology at all possible. But in small steps, every step of the way. I thought A8 was great in 86. I thought that was God's gift to people in audiology. I know now that uh, a lot of things have happened since then, and a lot of things will continue to happen for us to find best solutions. Hey, sorry. But what I would like you to take away from this presentation is that hearing life is what we want to be established for our people. And it is about the scenarios they live in. It's about the importance of those situations they want to hear in. It's about the wants and the needs of our users and the well-being of those people who wear our devices every day and every moment they wear our devices. We believe in tender emotions are fleeting moments in real life and we need to be able to catch them. Context and circumstance will drive intent and emotions for our users and for your customers. <coughs> and that's why we believe that real life hearing is what Widex will set our stars for in the future. And we hope that we will be able to bring evidence to you in future meetings to prove to you that getting closer to real life hearing is what it's all about. Thank you for listening. Thank you.